we'll get started. Um, welcome, and we didn't know how this would go with the reschedule and all the wonderful weather that we've had, and um, we tried to make it Wednesday to Wednesday, but that didn't work for our schedule, and so here we are Thursday, and thanks for all of you to show up today. And as we've been doing um, throughout this school year, we've been kind of highlighting some of our, our different programs and options that we want to make sure everyone knows, and this one's very, very new and is going to grow um, into other schools next year, so I think it's a great opportunity to talk to all of you about something we're trying to do, some some extending of our, maybe our highest learners going forward. And so we're, I'm going to hand it off to Brian Brutin, our associate superintendent, and I think he's going to hand it off to some of our teachers, and I was glad to see we have one of our students here too. So I'll stop talking, and it'll be Brian at this point. Hi, everyone. I appreciate the opportunity to share um, an exciting new program that we've been piloting in Midland Public Schools for the past two years um, and will expand out into the rest of our elementary schools uh, the following year. Um, it really has been an interesting journey in trying out some different pieces of this and uh, I want to stress a couple things before we begin. Currently still it is a pilot and so I know that a lot of hands are going to go up at the end of this. There will be a lot of questions. We'll give you the concrete answers that we have and we'll be extremely honest with you and tell you the that's a pending um, decision as well to um, pilots teaching us a lot and we're continuing to grow within this program. Um, but you see here that we have lots of guest teachers that are with us. We have a student as well too. Luann will introduce our teachers and our guest student as well when the time comes and um, they're going to share with you some real exciting things because that's really where some of the magic is happening within this program. So um, as you could see on the display board, uh, the name of the program is Prodigy. Um, this isn't a canned program. We didn't buy this. This is something that we created internally and there were a lot of people that contributed to the design of this program including our staff members that are uh, working on designing the curriculum and also a lot of uh, previous instructors of our gifted and talented programs help contribute to the ultimate design of this program as well too. And you can see that the uh, analogy has a fancy acronym to it, um, promoting rigorous opportunities to develop innovative and gifted youth. Um, and I want to give you a touch of the background so you can understand the context of what Prodigy is, why we created it, and where we hope that it will serve us in the future. Um, our venture into Prodigy and gifted and talented, it, it's not new in Midland Public Schools. For those that know the history of Midland Public, there's been a lot of gifted and talented programs throughout the year. And it uh, was a program for a while, and we've had various different versions of it. Um, and what we've created now really came from two main reasons. The first main reason is when we went to authorization uh, to make all of our elementary schools IBPYP, they really forced us to take a look at some of our internal operations and how it was that we were presenting content. And one of, I think, the most glaring things that stood out within the IB practices um, was the thought that our learning really should truly be transdisciplinary, meaning that you can connect the core content areas, what you're learning in math and ELA and the social studies can connect together. And when we were taking some of our gifted learners at the time, removing them from the classroom and having them learn core subjects in the next grade level, that really didn't help us promote transdisciplinary learning because there was a disconnect and our units that we developed um, weren't quite meshing that way. So I'd be really challenged us to think um, about whether or not that practice was giving us what we truly wanted in the delivery of our core curriculum and it challenged us to try and deliver these services to some of our most talented kids but also provide them the authenticity and the rigor that comes along with the transdisciplinary concepts. Um, that's great on paper and it sounds fancy but when you take a practice that's been happening within Midland Public for a long time and say okay we need to find something, stop it and move it, we know emotions are going to be involved and we know that it doesn't work to just take something away without replacing it and replacing it with something better. Right? And so that's where Prodigy really came from on this. Um, for the past uh, years, if you were gifted and talented within Midland Public Schools in grades K through 5, our services that we we're offering were one, always differentiation within the classroom. That's always our primary mode and our instructors do a wonderful job at trying to make um, each kid's individualized learning experience as authentic as they can. But we also had something that was called cross-grading, if you're familiar with that term. And cross-grading happened in grades three, four, and five, and only in the subject of mathematics. And what we found when we were looking at our data is that we really had progressive cross-grading 
enrollment. And what I mean by that is third grade numbers would usually double into fourth. And fourth grade numbers would typically double into fifth. And we would have roughly in the district around 25-ish uh, students total throughout K-5 elementaries that were cross-grading. Um, and that was pretty stable. Sometimes you'd have a little higher number. Sometimes you'd have a little bit lower. But we also found that there were pockets within Midland Public Schools, and actually entire schools, that had zero cross-graders um, as well. And so when we looked at that and we thought, well, we may be able to expand our services, reach kids in subject areas that aren't just mathematics, because we know that there are students that are gifted sometimes in ELA and some of the other core subjects, um, while also really reflecting and making our core learning within grade levels truly transdisciplinary. So we set out our objectives, and our objectives were to, number one, increase the number of students that we were serving. We wanted to get that number from around that 25 mark, and we want to eventually get to near 100 students K-5 that were serving gifted and talented. Um, and we also wanted to, as I said, uh, expand our GT services not to students that are just solely gifted in mathematics and reach some of our learners that we think are really thriving in some of the other areas as well, too. Um, that was our core theme and our core vision when we were designing these programs. And then we had to set out, design something, and see if it would work. And hence the pilot of the new models of gifted and talented services and the fine folks that you see sitting here today that are blazing these trails for us and offering some of these programs. And so our timeline really kind of followed this model. In 1718, two years back, uh, Siebert was our very first school that piloted what we called our, our proof of concept. What we did at Siebert to promote the transdisciplinary learning is the students that were being cross-graded in grades three and four, we moved those cross-grading services to before school. So those students would get their extra content in mathematics for about half hour, 40 minutes before school, four times a week. And then they could participate in their core units with their instructors, um, and we tried that for a year just to see, A, would the students still learn? at the same pace? Were they truly getting that authentic individualization they wanted to? And would this before school model present barriers for our parents in terms of transportation, attendance, et cetera, before we expanded out? We learned a lot during that first year. Uh, we learned that there were some barriers that we had to address. We learned that frequency was a bit of an issue too. Um, little tykes getting up four times a, a week, um, but a half hour, 40 minutes earlier, we know the research tells us that, that can be tough a little bit when we, everyone needs their sleep cycles and those type of things. And so we found that that Siebert model said that it can work, but we can have a few tweaks that we need. Um, that progressed into this year, into 1819, and we decided to expand the official Prodigy program, and we expanded it to three schools. Uh, we chose Chestnut Hill, we chose Central Park, and we chose Plymouth as our schools that would actually pilot the Prodigy program this year. We tweaked it a bit where it wouldn't be four mornings per week. We tweaked it to be two mornings per week, about a half hour, 40 minutes apiece, with really an exploratory year for curriculum where we have our teachers that are really kind of blazing trails in each of their schools to see which type of curriculum is working, where we can learn with each other, collaborate with each other before we officially expand out to our other schools. In 1920, next year, we are going to expand this to all of our elementary schools, so everyone will have a Prodigy program. Um, at that time, we will be serving nearly 90 to 95 as our projected students, so we'll get to our target goal of approximately 100. And really for us, this was a time to say it's good to formalize what our gifted and talented services will be for our students. So we can define on paper what those are. Put on the website, if you think that your student is gifted and or talented, here are the different options that your students will have in MPS. We haven't revised those formalities in quite a long time, and we do get occasional calls from parents saying, I want my student to skip a grade. Well, they've been so few and so rare that we've been kind of handling them case by case. As a part of this entire revision, we formalize that process, what that will look like, as well as formalizing what we want to happen for Prodigy and also for the future of cross-grading as well, too. 
We'll get to those policies. I'll give you a slide on that at the end because I'm sure that's something that you're really going to want to see and know about. And we'll wrap up the presentation with what those formal policies are going to look like. Um, but what I really want to focus on now is what our current Prodigy pilots look like, what they're doing, and have you hear from the instructors that are doing it and the students that's doing it as well too. Um, so to recap, this program serves students in grades three through five. Um, research really tells you that to identify K-1-2 um, as gifted and or talented can present some challenges. Um, there's some agreement and disagreement on three versus four versus five, but we feel that by third grade we start to see some students that are starting to rise and need to be challenged a little bit more. Um, and at our grades, at our schools, our three schools that have Prodigy right now, we have one facilitator each in those schools, uh, with the exception of Central Park, and due to the size of Central Park, we were blessed that administration supported us with having two Prodigy uh, instructors there as well, so we can keep the numbers a little bit lower to make sure that we're challenging kids individually as well, too. And this next piece here, our goal in this program is to challenge the top three to five percent of students. And I really want to take a minute here to explain this to you because I, I can anticipate questions already saying, what are the cut scores on the assessment? Where is the matrix that we're used to seeing? And this is one of the things for Prodigy that's going to create, um, we know a bit of anxiety, but will help us meet what our goals and objectives are. When we say 3 to 5 percent, we're talking about 3 to 5 percent at each school. And so because we have multiple schools, what is top 3 to 5 percent at school A may not be the same as what the top 3 to 5 percent is at school B. If we were setting just a static cut, we may have schools and places that would not be serving a volume of kids. And we think that serving a higher volume of students with that school being able to individualize will help us meet our target of really starting to push more of our top learners than we were before just with about that approximate 25 number that we had. And so if you're going to ask me, Brian, what is the exact cut math score that it takes to get into this program? We don't have one, and I'm not going to put the slide up there, because when we're looking at each individual school, it's going to vary a touch based on what the clientele that is from each of our individual schools as well. Um, we also take teacher recommendation into this as well, because some of the assessments that we look at, we all know, realize, acknowledge, a student may have had a bad day, it, maybe the assessment isn't their strong point, but sometimes teachers just know. And they know that there are certain students that really need to be challenged in certain ways. And we also have parents that sometimes just know. Um, and so we have to take that into consideration. And then we have some internal processes that we use to try and vet that. Because it, once this goes public, um, Prodigy really has kind of been, I don't want to say it's a secret. We haven't done it that way. But this is our first public presentation on it. And um, there's certain points where people are starting to become more aware. This, of course, will be one of them. But I think the day that we bought the t-shirts for everybody and those got handed out, there were a lot of heads going, no, that's pretty cool. What is that? And why am I not in it? And where's my bumper sticker? Right? And so some of these type of things will start to make this a little bit more prominent and, and those questions will um, be answered as they come through. Um, as I stated, we meet twice weekly before school and here in lies now some of the challenges that we learned with Siebert um, as well too. We found that students eligible in fifth grade, um, we didn't want them to have to make a choice between participating in Prodigy and participating in Band. Oftentimes, those two would conflict with each other because a lot of students that are gifted and talented also are in the band as well, too. So we walked to um, our scheduler of our auxiliary services. Scott, you've met him many times before. He's, I think, presented to pick almost every single time. Um, and we challenged him to give every single school doing Prodigy two mornings free of band so a student wouldn't have to choose between the two that they could participate in Prodigy and participate in band at their school as well. We plan to do that next year as well to not force those choices and we're really going to rely on our internal schedulers to be able to make that happen. Um, and as we've stated many times, our, our Prodigy facilitators really are the ones that are making this program go. They're the ones that are in the trenches working with the kids each and every single day. And I think the value for you is going to be able to hear from them about what they're doing with the kids, some of the successes that they've had, and actually see one of our students and what the projects um, that they've been doing have met with them as well, too. So at this, at this point, point, I'm going to turn it over to Luann. Um, Luann, if you don't, if you don't mind introducing our team, our team and, then and then our team, team will talk to you a little bit about, about what's been going on in some of the schools, schools and, and we'll hear from them. Chestnut Hill, we have Elizabeth Owens, with, who works 
with her in the mornings. At Central Park, we have Jillian Struble and Amanda Laddick. And this is Henry Kosick, who is going to be sharing some of the work he's done in Prodigy uh, this year. So thank you for being with us, Henry. And then at Plymouth, we have Kelly Krause. So how about if we start, well, kind of where we started at the beginning of the year. Um, want to talk about the Joe Bowler piece? Green, yellow's on. Oh, it's on. All right. Um, so at the beginning of the year, we all started with math. Um, we decided it was a safe place to start. With it being a pilot, we didn't really have any set expectations, so we got some freedom there. Um, so we used a program called U Cubed. They've got these weeks of inspirational math that were developed at Stanford University by a professor named Joe Bowler, and she really takes the kids through looking at math as a challenge and not something that you're either good at or you're bad at. So we were able every week to push them to looking at patterns. And it was fun because other than the beginning, the very first activity was the four fours activity where they had to try to do a math equation using four fours, adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing, whatever it is to equal every number from one to 20, I think we went to. But other than that, we didn't really use a lot of numbers the whole time. So we kind of changed from what they were used to seeing. We weren't just doing long division and seeing what they could do, but we were challenging them to see patterns. Um, and we just kind of looked at it as a growth mindset. Every week there was a video that went along, which basically showed you that you need to be challenged. Your brain won't grow otherwise. And so every week we went through. And we've actually just kind of started picking back up into that. And um, So that's where we started for basically the first marking period. Went through those first two weeks of inspirational math um, through Stanford University. I don't know, did I miss anything? Elizabeth, do you want to add something to that piece? Oh, sure. <laughs> Maybe how your kids yeah, I agree with um, Amanda about the Joe Bowler piece with um, U Cubed. Um, my kids really are strong math kids for the most part, so they really grasp onto that and they enjoy it a lot. Um, I agree again with what Amanda said about I really like the way that it's set up because it's not um, plug and chug equations. We're not just looking and extending them into the next gra grade level. We're kind of extending them at a point where they can look at math conceptually and kind of understand the process of why things are the way they are, why equations we have are written the way they are, um, which I think will be beneficial when they move on to sixth grade and um, beyond for, well, not just sixth grade, but every grade level above, just because they can look at math that way. Yeah? So then we kind of shifted into an online learning format called Out of Eden Learn. And what it is, is it's a learning community that engages um, students of similar socioeconomic statuses and location um, in a variety of learning experiences. So we all together kind of put all of our classes, we had like a prodigy class, um, and we ended up meeting with another group. Um, we're put in what's called walking parties. And we were with a group from Mexico, a group from Switzerland, a group from Chicago, um, and Massachusetts, I think, was the last one. And we engage in what are called learning experiences. And these learning experiences follow um, the journey of Paul Salopek. And he's a journalist with National Geographic. And he is currently walking the same route of humankind. So they're really studying, and he has been for the past couple of years. When I taught fifth grade, I did this, well, it's been four years ago now. Um, so he's documenting with a lot of um, cultures that we don't typically hear about on the news, just for the sheer fact that he's walking um, and not taking a, you know, an airplane um, like we would see typically. So um, every week there was a task for students and it really got them to kind of slow down and work on observing the world carefully, um, exchanging different stories and perspectives with people that are different from themselves um, and making connections between their own lives and something outside of Midland. And I know for us at Central Park that was a really um, engaging experience for those kids that may not necessarily have stepped outside of Midland, so to see like videos and hear from people in other cultures was something um, very valuable to them. So I'm going to have Henry here. Um, he is one of our Prodigy students, but he's also my student um, in my own class. So um, Henry's going to share one of his activities with you. Just click the yep, 
Hi, my name is Henry Kosick and I am in third grade at Central Park Elementary. For Out of Eden Learn, we had an assignment to listen to neighborhood stories. I chose to interview Doug, whose parents opened Sid's party store in Midland. Here was the interview. that you really remember that's happened. Uh, Joe, have a good day. Uh, the one I remember the most was uh, in 62, we had a fire. Huh. It burnt the place down and they had to rebuild it. I was uh, nine years old. Huh. I never knew that. And we used to have a lumber yard that was built on the side of the store, yeah. and they were worried when it caught fire that that was going to burn down, so they had all the fire departments huh. here, and um, then I remember when they built the Bay Gas Station, and now that's a historical site, cool. and the building over here where the coffee shop is, that was Midland's first bowling alley. Cool. And I actually never knew that. And behind that, the next block over, it, they had a fire and it burnt down. That was uh, Midland's first hospital. Oh. Just hot. Yes, I, uh, I'll have the mild in tomorrow. Okay. Sorry, Pat. It's pretty cool. I never knew that. I didn't know there was a hospital back there either. I never knew there was a fire here. Yeah, the poor rats lived there. wasn't a hospital anymore, they uh, rented out the, some of the roofs, and um, then when the poor rats passed, they, uh, whoever bought it, uh, rented it out, and um, some lady was in a candle or something, and burned the place down. Huh. <laughs> and then remember what we said was, used to be in Grove Park? I don't know. Oh yeah, the school. The yeah, high school used to be. Yeah, yeah but I just can't imagine this neighborhood a long time ago. Yeah, it was uh, in uh, Ashman used to be two-way one time. Hmm. And the same with Rod Street. Yeah. Weird. And now they want to do that again? <laughs> yes. They don't know what they want to do. That's probably the best. That's good. That's this activity helped me learn to become a better communicator by asking open-ended questions. My favorite part of this activity was learning more about my neighborhood and how things have changed over the years. We thought we would take a minute to, Kelly Krause has chosen to do um, a project with her students that's an out of school voluntary mm -hmm. project. So I'll let Kelly tell you about right. what she's been working on with her students. Yeah, there are a couple of the pictures up here um, kind of reflects that. Um, this, this one is one of my students, uh, Elliot. King, and then um, this is Allie and her mom. Anyway, the, the program is called um, Destination Imagination, and it's uh, pretty much kind of the new hybrid of Odyssey of the Mind. And Odyssey of the Mind and Destination Imagination um, take all the elements of education that we can be learning from and try to put them together. So there's a little bit of drama involved, there's science, there's math. Um, and you can kind of lean in whatever direction you want to go. Um, parents have to commit to this by paying a fee. So there is a registration fee. Um, and then there's also a fee to just participate as well. So it was a pretty decent cost, only about $100. Up to seven students could be involved. And I just addressed it to only the Prodigy kids. I wanted to make sure they were the ones I was working with. Um, it, predominantly third and fourth graders were interested and then we had up to seven kids who wanted to do it and I brought the rules of the road for the program so I thought I'd pass those around and let you guys look at them. Um, my students chose what's called monster effects which is uh, they have to create a uh, structure that could hold weight 
Um, and this is a structure tester that we created. It's a mock structure, structure tester. And their structure is actually right here. And this, so they had to research and try to find out how to create a structure that would only weigh a certain amount, it had to be 175 grams or less, and at the same time could hold a lot of weight. Uh, because the way they actually had to figure out their score was to take the structure tester, the structure weight, and then the amount of weight on the top is divided by the weight of the structure. Um, and they actually take off and put on the weights, so they add, they add the weight twice, so to speak. Okay, it's, it's kind of complicated for third and fourth graders, but they figured it out pretty quickly. So uh, then they also had to make a story about a monster, and the structure in some way had to have a special effect that would be triggered by the addition or the removal of the weight. So uh, the kids worked with us, they worked with each other, they did research, they even worked with some of the robotics guys from Midland High. Um, and you know, those are, that's, you can't see them, but they're kind of, their backs are to, are to us in the picture, but they came in with some ideas and really helped us out. So they did a lot of troubleshooting and they had to retest and retest the structure many times. Um, the hardest part for us was trying to make the uh, special effect happen. That was really challenging because there's lots of rules that the kids have to follow. And this is, this is just the handbook for the monster effect itself. So that was, and this is one of the scripts. So if you just want to pass those around to different people, they can see. But the kids um, over and over really were excited and said, I love this. I want to do it next year. Um, it's something that a parent could lead. And in some ways, it might be a little easier to have a couple parents team up and do it. It was a lot of time and energy on my part, but the kids have enjoyed it tremendously. And they have to do all the work themselves. Um, you know, they'll even argue with me about it. Mrs. Cross, you're interfering. You're not supposed to interfere. <laughs> and I'll be like, okay, but you can be learning too from what I'm saying. But in the end, it's their final, the final decision is made by them as to how they're going to do the script. And we're right in the middle at this point of trying to tweak it and get it as good as we can get it because they have to actually present in the competition on Saturday. So that's coming up. So that's pretty much it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh -huh. um, maybe do we have like two minutes we can talk a little bit about what's happening next. Um, do you want to talk about our next piece that we had discussed? Like where you're going with your kids next? Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, so with my kids, I am going to start pushing science because science is my passion <laughs> and they also love that as well um, so I did like a survey with them and I was like if you wanted to do because we've worked a lot with Joe Bowler with her math methods so I did like just a quick Google classroom survey to see where do you want me to go next with this what would you like to do next they pr were predominantly science focused anyway so we're just going to continue to do quick little science projects with them um, we just did parachute to figure out the concept of drag um, and that's what I'm going to keep doing. I'll keep throwing in a few more of Joe Bowler's um, quick little modules throughout the year, but I'm predominantly going to be focusing um, in the science field with my kids. Um, Jillian and I are doing pretty much a similar idea. A few weeks ago, uh, we were supposed to have a meeting all together in January, and obviously we... <laughs> I don't know if you knew this, but we had some snow days. Um, um, so we're aware. Yeah, right. January got wiped off really the calendar. So we kept kind of going, oh, all right, what are we going to do next? We don't want to totally shift because we were trying to do this together. So we gave them an opportunity um, at the end of January to inquire on their own and research and basically tell us, what do you guys want to do? We explained to them what a pilot is and how we're still trying to figure it out and basically explain that we want to know what you want to know. It's for you not for us, and so we gave them that opportunity, and they got to spend a couple days researching and then presented us with what we should do next and why. A lot of the kids just want to say, let's just do this, but then we force them to say, well, what is it? What are we going to learn from it? How do we do it? What do we need? And so they got that chance, and um, we finished those presentations on Tuesday, actually. Mm -hmm. It was pretty neat to see some of the things that they've come up with, and some of them are a lot deeper than we had expected them to come up with. Mm -hmm. And they talk about, like, a lot of them were science topics. I know you had a science topic, didn't you? Yeah, mine wasn't the best, though. Everyone's house was really good. What was it about? <laughs> I was just, like, 
this like slow movement. Like I, it was dripping two different colors of food coloring into water, and then um, seeing how they both meet together and form a different color. So different, like. Reactions and things with properties of matter, chemical reactions, um, geology, geology things, rocks, math, animal research. So we kind of let them, and then they, it was nice because they got to do a Google slide um, to present kind of their facts to us. So we got that technology piece in there too with, with the writing components as well. So we're going to, it looks like from now here on out, we're going to do some experimentation and then some math to get back in there. So where we're headed at Central Park. Well, today I just, actually probably Tuesday, I, I had the kids fill out some ideas as to what they were interested in doing. We had also done, as an offshoot of um, Destination Imagination, we had created structures similar to the one that's in there. And I used the structure, structure tester in our class with Prodigy. And the kids tried, OK, what would happen if we only took three of the rolled up pieces of paper and put rubber bands around them. And they, they are just estimating to see, do they get uh, the same amount of weight, less weight? Um, what does the ratio come out to be? And so we're kind of wrapping that up right now. But a lot of my kids in sharing, and we did more of uh, kind of like a, we haven't actually presented anything, or we just went through, got some ideas. A lot of them seem to be interested in chemistry. Uh, I had a lot of uh, interest in electricity. And uh, several students wanted to bounce off and kind of do their own thing. So we talked about having what's called a genius hour. And that would be where students could pair together, work on certain things with each other, um, or do something on their own. You know, one girl was interested in phobias. She was talking about, I mean, I've always wanted to learn what this is because I have certain things I'm afraid of and I want to understand it better. So it's just a lot of, a lot of different ways we could go. I just made sure to, you know, emphasize that you're learning from this, you know, you're not just doing it to, because it's just fun, you know, and I, I'd like to make cupcakes or something like that, you know, because one of my kids was saying culinary chemistry, which I thought was kind of neat. They wanted to understand how food actually becomes the way it is when you mix it. So looking at mixtures. One of the things I really like about experiencing this is seeing how the district has gone from one, ex one end of the spectrum to the other, or maybe kind of continued in the same frame because I taught endo years ago. So I saw what the endo prog program was like. And one of the elements I loved about endo was the opportunity to have choice. It's really, really important for GT kids. Um, they need to be able to explore what they're excited about. And uh, I really thought uh, Destination Imagination gave them those opportunities. Almost every kid in the group, no matter what their interest was, had something they could do, either a skit, or they could do the backdrop, or they loved the science. Um, and the same thing, I think we're trying to do that within the program itself, too, with Prodigy. We're taking uh, the math, and we're giving them those opportunities. We've given them the opportunity to do writing, reading, throughout of Eden. And then now we're kind of expanding and opening it up to them. And that's really huge with GT kids. So it's been nice. Mm -hmm. So um, thank you all. Appreciate it very much. Very exciting. And thank you for the hard work in it. Um, next year, our, our Prodigy team will expand by two, right, two additional schools, two additional instructors. And uh, Luann has blessed us with um, writing proposals to our Board of Education to support professional development for our team, to be able to meet and to collaborate and to keep coming up with ideas and figure out what's working and what's not working. And we, we hope to continue that because we know that there's value in uh, the cross collaboration between schools and, and great ideas to be had amongst each other. Um, I had mentioned earlier that we're really utilizing this rollout of Prodigy District wide to reestablish what our GT services are as a district and evolving from what's on paper now to what our next generation of services will be. So to recap, what is on paper now is for GT services for students that are in grades K through 5, we offer cross grading and cross grading for grades 3 through 5 in mathematics only. Uh, a footnote when students do cross grade in fifth grade, 
Um, that means that they're traveling to the middle school for sixth grade mathematics, and that typically happens before their um, actual elementary day starts, right? So we are now transforming that into three options, and this will roll out in 1920. Um, option one for students that are eligible for GT services will be um, Prodigy, the program that you heard about today, again, expanding to each and every single elementary that we have in Midland Public Schools. Um, number two, and I want to emphasize rare circumstances, happens maybe once a year. Um, I think the most I've ever seen in my five years with NPS was two, um, is grade skipping. And this would be something that a parent feels that their student is ahead um, of their peers and wants them to skip an actual grade. Um, we have gone from handling them case by case to actually formalizing that application process. And we'll be publishing what that application process is for parents that want to. Um, one thing that we have learned is that that really requires some intense counseling from our end to really let people know what those choices may mean down the road. Um, sometimes when you're in second and third grade, you're not really thinking about course options in the high school world. And we found that some sessions with our people that really understand our secondary course offerings for students that are going to eventually end up with IB, AP, some decisions that you make early on could have some impacts down the road. It's hard to anticipate what our course offerings will be seven or eight years down the line, but there's some consistencies that we can help coach parents on before they truly make those decisions because there are sometimes impacts um, that, that may sway people one way or another. Um, and so we've formalized that process. Uh, the other piece of it, um, cross-grading is not going away in its entirety. Um, cross-grading in mathematics in grade three and four as we know it now won't be happening, but we still will be allowing cross-grading in fifth grade. So if students want to take sixth grade mathematics as a fifth grade student, we're still going to allow that. Um, there's a couple of reasons behind that. Um, number one is that we don't feel that that's going to interrupt the transdisciplinary learning that I talked before about. And the reason it's not going to is because that first hour of instruction, the middle school really doesn't inhibit their normal start time at the elementary levels. Um, and so they, there's usually a little bit of an overlap, but that 15 minutes or so isn't going to interrupt that. And the other piece of it is we know that there's a lot of people that are very passionate about math and really want to get themselves a, a head start and movement um, into that next level. And so we're still going to offer that option. When we had talked with parents and teachers and staff and our middle school instructors, they felt that it was important to preserve that piece of, of the cross grade aspect that we did. So there still will be a test in process for that. Um, Luann and the curriculum department will be running that test in process um, and they are going to be utilizing similar testing and assessments to what we've been doing and continuing to explore and see if there's other assessments out there that um, as the future progresses give us a little bit more of an authentic view on it. But that's something to be determined best by the curriculum folks for what they feel is the best measure for that. So these will be our, our formal three options that we have for students in GT services. We really, again, recalibrating back to what our goals were. Our goals were, one, to expand the number of kids that we were serving. As a district, we were in that 25 approximate range each and every single year. Um, by this time next year, we'll be near that 100 range. So that will be a, a, an accomplishment for that goal. Um, I think that the presentations the teachers gave you were evident that we're meeting goal number two, which was to expand into other subject areas just from math mathematics as well to be able to challenge some of those other students and you know we, we really truly as a district um, have been focused on closing our achievement gap but we also still know that there are students at, at the top range and we know that peer interaction with other students of similar capabilities can really help them grow as well too and we think that this program is going to help us do a little bit better job of that accomplishment than what we've been doing as a district. So we, we've been excited um, and truly blessed to have the instructors that we do um, that signed up to take this um, on as um, a part of their daily life. You know, when you think about it from an instructor workload standpoint, that means a couple mornings a week that they're getting up a little bit early or in the prep and the time that that takes to set up, as well as the multiple hours of, of um, collaboration time that they've put in as well, too. We're excited to see where this goes and the ideas will continue to evolve as well to hopefully try and strengthen our program um, each and every single year. So. Um, at this point, we're open to questions that you have for myself, for our Prodigy team, our student as well too. We're happy to answer any questions that you may have about the program, um, visions that we have for the future. We'll try to do our best to take care of any curiosities that you have. Yes, ma'am. Um, you pointed out that the hours in the morning are to accommodate fans. Students, what about orchestra students? I'm sorry. What about orchestra students in general? Are they 
right? City yeah. hours accommodating them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, all music yes. programs. All, all music. music. Yeah. Okay, so you're, you, I'm going to say this in a nice way. Your slide should re re reflect that. Duly noted. Understand. Uh, know that our scheduling agent who's doing that, Scott, um, he's in charge of all music programs, so and so when he's scheduling those things, my verbal faux pas does not reflect what he's really, try, really trying to do for all students involved in the music program. Thank you for that correction. I appreciate that. That was our intention. Yep. Sure. Other questions we have for the program that we can answer for you? Okay. Thank I, you. We appreciate it. No, I, I do. I yeah. Do. This doesn't affect me. My kids are 11 and 12 years. Right. But when they were in kindergarten, before you came on board, before you came on board, there was a gifted and talented program then. And kids were pulled out of the kindergarten class. I still know who they are. I still know what they're doing in high school. I worry about the fact that you're not going to allow them to cross grade in math until fifth grade. Because I know these three boys that I'm thinking of are doing it in first and are excellent in math. And are going to be in math fields when they go to college. I know that for a fact. So why are you limiting it and doing a disservice to the younger kids that would probably do that better if they were cross-rated right. earlier? The disservice yeah. would be a strong word because research base would tell you too early is not good. And we'll still get those kids to the same accent that those three boys probably were along the way. And then differentiation, and the teachers can talk about that better than I can, mm -hmm. but differentiation how we're doing accomplishing the same things in there. Um, GT has changed over the years. So we're, we're, we're using the word GT today, but it really doesn't exist anymore. GT came from really um, a grant program. They came from the government for gifted and talented kids, and that was wiped out a decade. Well, you probably know it better than me, a decade ago. Um, those yeah. things were gone. And so um, those things began to change and shift. And so we're, you know, we've always done very, very well with our high achieving kids, but we are looking at um, different ways of doing that in different subject areas. Well, so that's kind of why we're still pushing and getting back into that field. But um, cross grading at a very early age, there's a lot of research to say that's not a good thing. Are, are you sure it was cross grading, or were you thinking we're the end now program? I'll go back to slide. The not grade skipping, the cross grading now. So you remember them being cross graded? Yes, they were cross graded. Grade. Yes, there was a, at least a half a dozen kids at Adams that went up to Northeast in fifth grade, and they had been in cross graded classes since about right. first or second grade. So, like, that's just my... Yep, understand, and I yeah, appreciate that opinion. We. What do you, what do you mean by differentiation? So yeah. the club. Can I speak as a parent about that? Sure. Yeah, please. I've had kids, I, my two younger ones are in Prodigy at Central Park. My oldest one, this didn't exist, but he was still very much pushed and is in the accelerated and was on the bubble about whether he wanted to cross grade in sixth grade to seventh grade now. But he's just taken the advanced ones from there on out, sorry, I don't know whose hand was raised back here, but. Um, so they, in the classroom, they know who their ones who are really quick at the grade level math are. Oh, yeah. And they, they supplement that with extra whether work. extra work yeah. and different work, and even explaining what you know to your peers to develop that level of knowledge on that subject. Yeah. So I've, I've experienced it without cross-grading. That the differentiation is very evident in the classroom. I just want to make sure if that was still happening. Cool. Sure. That yeah. Brian, you got the mic. Yeah, you know, d d differentiation used to be a term that was actually separated out, um, and we had a differentiation team that worked on those type of things. Um, t now it is just an expectation um, of all of our teachers to differentiate for each and every single one of their students. The the day of um, packaged curriculum for every single student is is gone, and I, I don't want to go down rabbit holes because there's another presentation coming on something called the performance index um, that Penny Middle and Miller Nelson will be presenting to you. I'll probably help out and chime in because when they're talking about data I can never help myself um, on it. And <laughs> But that our world now of accountability holds us accountable for the growth of each and every single student and it doesn't matter if the student is at level A or if they're at level Z. Um, and we found within Midland Public that challenging the A and the Z um, has been much more difficult than challenging the middle grounds, right? your L through your O. And when we really take a critical look at the data, um, 
one of our most challenging growth areas has been amongst some of our most elite learners. And the systems of old for us were not producing outcomes in their growth um, versus peers in the state. And again, there'll be another presentation coming that will explain that much deeper. And so the data was telling us that our growth amongst our most elite, especially in the elementary levels, could have used a little bit of a steroid shot. And we feel that this method may help us um, push that as well. You know, time will tell. Um, we'll continue to study data as well. As I said, you know, I emphasize the pilot portion of this. You see that we're experimenting and pushing and things like that. And we'll continue to refine our practices and selection and assessment and curriculum over time. And we'll also study our growth data to see if we're getting enhanced growth amongst our learners um, as well too. And, and if we're not getting the results we want, that's the beautiful thing about education. You can tweak things and move a little bit as well. Too. So understand your perspective, appreciate that, and um, know that when we made these decisions, a lot of it was based on some data studying to see if we were getting the outcomes that we wanted, um, and we didn't just take lightly making a decision because we know that, that there's passion um, in some of past practices. We, we get that and understand and honor that, and there were a lot of people that put some hard work into that, and as I said, we really don't want to take something away without replacing it with something we think can lead to just a touch more enhanced outcomes. So, um, with that, our teachers, um, they're, they're on leave right now from their buildings. We want to make sure that they can get back and get to their routines as well. So um, thank you, teachers, very much for coming and sharing your experiences. We, we greatly appreciate it. And thank you all for attending. It's been a pleasure talking with you today. Okay. Mm -hmm.